Ladies and gentlemen, now hosting the Rizzo cast, put your hands together for Steven Risotto. What is going on, everybody, and welcome. This is episode number 74 of RizzoCast. I'm Steven Risotto, joined alongside Jasper Lindsay, as always. And today we are joined by a very special guest. She is uh, the head softball coach at Florida State University. Next season will be her 14th season as head coach. It is Coach Lonnie Alameda. Coach Alameda, what's going on? Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. And I can't believe it's 14 seasons. Time flies. That's crazy when you say that, but thank you for having me. Yes, for sure. 14 seasons does fly for sure. I could imagine. Uh, first of all, it's the middle of the summer and your team just wrapped up a few months back. Uh, it's definitely less hectic, I'm sure, than it was. Uh, but I'm sure a lot of outsiders also are probably wondering what the softball program does maybe this time of year. So is there any activity going on? What is this time of year like for you? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people don't realize how college sports has gotten to be year round. So um, there definitely is part of your building and training as an athlete, some downtime. Um, That's usually about 10 days after your season ends, 10 to 15 days. um, You get to go be a kid and and do nothing, but then you kick into your summer workout plans. And if you're on a mission to get a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, um, maybe a little more you know, healthy to take care of certain parts of the body that took a beating during the season and your summertime becomes a a big part of it. So a lot of the kids are committed to their workout plans um, and then their rehab plans. So when they get back here, which we start school in a couple weeks, uh, they're ready to hit the ground running and and get after it pretty hard. Yeah. And we, we actually just did see the United States national softball team walk away with uh, a silver medal during this year's Olympics. So I guess the, the world of softball is not completely uh, sleeping right now. Uh, that was a horrible, that was a horrible way to describe it. Sleeping. What, but, uh, (laughs) did you have the opportunity to watch any of that unfold? Well, crazy enough. Um, I was coaching with team Canada, so I was over in Tokyo. Um, so yes, I was, uh, there with one of, uh, Jasper's alumni. Um, we had uh, a player on our team from Wisconsin. She played at Wisconsin, so KJ Hermish. So we had some fun over there. We bronze medal. That was the first time that Canada's um, medaled uh, in the game. So that was pretty exciting for us. And um, yeah, what an experience. So I was two days after the World Series, got on a plane and been gone for two months traveling around for it. So you're right, the softball world doesn't sleep. Um, it, it's still going in the summertime. Uh, not only were we playing the Olympics, but there's also an Athletes Unlimited um, and a professional league going. So there's some of that going. We have kind of a Cape Cod League. Um, so a lot of the players that didn't play uh, a lot of innings in the season played down in some, some South Florida. And there was probably like uh, eight teams down there that they play for about six weeks. Um, they compete down there together and, uh, getting after that. And then there's the big club ball recruiting. So as a coach, you're usually out recruiting June and July. So softball is going at, at all levels, high and low, but I was fortunate to be out in Tokyo and, and get a chance to see team USA and team Canada and Japan, the host country win a gold medal. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. How do you get picked to, you know, be on a, on the coaching staff for, for team Canada, how, how does one go through that process? Is it hand selected? Does the head coach read, reach out to you? You have to apply. How does that process work? Yeah, I think every country is a little bit different in, in how they do it. I know in the U.S. it's, it's an application process um, and uh, you have to work through junior teams and national teams in order to get picked for one of the Olympic coaches. Um, I've been with um, Canada and the, and the program since 2000. Two, So I've been working with them, whether it's um, just going up and helping out with some summer camp stuff or working with our pitchers or whatever it might be. And due to COVID and the Olympics getting pushed back a year, their current pitching coach that they had, he couldn't take another year away from his job. So unfortunately, he had to be able to move on. So I wasn't there for the for, for the four full years of it. And it ended up being a five-year cycle with COVID. So I kicked into last year. And um, just because of my relationship with the program, um, my ability to, to understand um, how they run and work with all the pitchers, it was kind of an easy fit for me to slide right in there and help them out. So I guess I got lucky and kind of grandfathered in a little bit towards, towards the end there. But, um, you know, I think the end goal was 
to give those athletes every opportunity to medal. Um, they put so much time in and effort in and, um, anyone that's kind of followed sports, you see how much COVID has mm, derailed your normal routine as an athlete. Um, but most athletes are pretty good with adversity. So they figure out different ways to do it. And this team Canada was no different. Um, some of them, I know Danielle Lara, she was away from her two children for almost 80 days, you know, you know, just, you got to go and you got to be away and, you know, you got COVID protocols and, you know, she, she made the commitment to the team. And so she was away from her family and her children. Lauren Bay was another one. So it just takes a, a whole nother level of commitment to see that through. And that was pretty special to be a part of. Yeah, it, it definitely, it definitely does kind of, uh, it definitely does give us fans kind of a chance to see the other side of sports and, kind of the, the personal side of what we don't normally see because everybody is going through their own uh, type of thing here. Uh, now let's get into kind of your seminals here. Uh, you guys came one win short of, I'm, I'm sure you're sick of hearing that, one win short of oh. a national title last <laughs> season. And there's a tough loss to Oklahoma, actually where you played uh, in the championship series of the College World Series. So does a loss like that, like sting even now a few months after the fact, or is it just more of kind of like a looking ahead type approach you have? Um, I think if you could say as a coach um, and even as a player in your time, um, if you're in a championship series, if you're at a world series, if you're in a super regionals every single year, um, you know, you're achieving something pretty high. And so, you know, for, for us, um, and, and I think you also know your team coming back. So you have some expectations of your team coming back and what you think you can accomplish. Um, I think every coach after coming after a, a, a COVID year and not really seeing a year through and then having to pack it up and then get after another year um, with a, a bigger squad, you didn't really know what you're going to expect. So I, I, we were extremely elated to be at the World Series and be in the Championship Series. I, I think we did a, a, a great job of coming together at the right time as a team. Um, as you're in it, Steve, of course, you want to win it, <laughs> you know, and of course, at the moment, um, you know, there, there's coaching emotions and there's personal emotions too, you know, having played at the University of Oklahoma and the University of Oklahoma softball team had a, a record-breaking year. Um, they, they hit an ungodly amount of home runs and um, you know, they were a tough train to slow down. And so that was a big feat for us. And, um, I think that we left every ounce of energy we could on that field. So it is pretty easy to walk away knowing that your seniors give everything you could as a coaching staff, we, we squeezed it to the nth degree to figure out what we could do. And, um, you know, I don't know if you guys watched, but, you know, we had to pull our catcher out. I mean, she was, absolutely exhausted in the third inning to just try to give her last at bat. So knowing that you just, you were buckled over because you gave everything you possibly could, uh, I think is a, a pretty courageous and successful season. Yeah, absolutely. And now shifting gears to your most recent uh, championship run 2018. And this is a question I've always wanted to ask, how does it feel to win yeah. a national title? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's pretty incredible. Um, I think it depends on maybe how you're, you go into it. So um, if you look at our program, what we're a very player led organization, we we'd like our teams to take ownership of themselves and the uniqueness of every team. And um, I think it's really important that, that they can play. It's a 70 game season for us. So by game 55, they should be able to play the game without us doing a whole lot. You know, we may make changes here and there. So in 2018, we lost the first game to UCLA and the players kicked us out of the dinner. We went back, had dinner. They kicked us out. They had a two hour meeting on their own and they took it and ran with it. And you could tell there was, a, there was a different beat to the drum because they were taking own ownership of the team and they were having so much fun with it. So uh, personally, as a coach, that was a really incredible feeling. I felt as if we put the time in and we gave them all the tools to be able to compete at the highest level and, and take it into their hands hand, which is something they'll have their whole life. And so, um, so personally as a coaching staff felt really amazing collectively to win in the conference has never won, um, to win one for Florida state, you know, to break history. That is just, uh, I mean, I, I still tear up sometimes watching some of the yeah. videos and, you know, even with, with players and we get together with, you know, some of our alumni, 
Um, so many of our alumni showed up this year to the championship game. They flew out there. They're with us because they know how special it is. So it's something I can't really bottle up and give to people. But I think when you think about something you work really hard at and you achieve it and you take that to 30 of your best friends and you be able to do that together, like it's just, it's an incredible feeling. Yeah. And, and FSU softball program has, you know, kind of been, been, known to have some big power numbers in the, in the offense in the past, but, you know, this year's team was kind of heavily reliant on, on pitching and defense. So what kind of goes on behind the scenes and preparation to make sure that, Hey, you know, pitching and defense is going to be our success plan this year, since we don't have maybe the big offense. Yeah. Well, I don't think that was the plan that we go going into it. <laughs> we had some kids that can contribute offensively. Um, we just couldn't find our stride. So I think the biggest thing for us about midseason was um, to not let the hitters get so frustrated that they pick, just contribute in their at-bats in any way possible because the pitching and defense was coming along pretty strong. And if you think about the defensive side, that's all the players that are on offense. So the whole entire team is contributing on one side of the ball, and we're doing a great job of it. So if we can just flip 50% of it and just be positive and have team at-bats, Maybe we can squeak some things out. And so I think to some players like Elizabeth Mason or Danny Morgan or even Sid Cheryl that have big power numbers years before and they weren't having those numbers, it was hard for them to find their identity. And then they're the leaders that you look at. So now they're trying to put this front on that it's okay. I don't have a home run or I don't have doubles, but it's okay. We'll be fine. Like that's hard because you think that where is it? I know I can hit home runs. Where is it coming from? And once they all settled down collectively about, you know, three weeks to the end of the season and said, hey, let's just let's just fight that bats. And if things happen, they happen. And once they let that guard down and just got after being selfless for their teams, you know, we went on this huge run. So um, so I, I think that the frustration of just not producing to what you think you can produce at, but then the trust in your teammates to your left and right to just do what you do. And let's get after it um, became a huge momentum builder for us as we went into postseason. And in many ways, I guess, you know, in 2020, COVID kind of blacked out that entire year. How important yeah. was it to follow up a lost year with another really, really strong campaign? Yeah, it, I mean, I as I'm sitting here and, and today writing up the plans for the fall and speaking to our mental performance coaches and um, talking about how we want to plan this fall. Um, we could have been two, two and Q, right? We could have been out, not even playing in postseason, or we could have been national champions. Like we were like, we were a hairline between both of them. And, you know, I, I go back to, I think our culture sustains us um, the ability to play for something bigger than just yourself. Cause if you're just in it yourself, it's a failure sport and it's really hard to get through, you know, but when you have your teammates with you and, and you can rely on teammates and you bring out the best of yourself, something special can happen. So, um, so yeah, trying, trying to figure out how we jump into this year. Like how do we jump into this year? And that senior class and that team last year catapulted us to a completely different feeling of belief. So all those freshmen that were part of last year, we had some really key players that were injured last year. They were on this journey with us of highs and lows and some really low lows to get to some really high highs. And now we can have these conversations like, man, you guys, the line between being out and being champions was right there for us. So if we can just keep staying positive and positive, and po you just don't know what can happen. And I think that's the story that we're going to be able to tell and move forward. And something I've learned years into my coaching year last year taught me so much, you know, just about not giving up and staying positive and, you know, keep feeding information and, and just, Try to be the best you could be every single day because you just don't know what's around the corner. So that's going to be a big one for us this year. And I think that really, in my vision for this program, has going to really catapult us, you know, uh, forward a ton and, and be very successful with all the kids, whether it's this coming season or, you know, the three, because we have close to 16 freshmen. You know, we're a very young program coming into this year. Yeah, so speaking of this season, we kind of saw the college world got – or college sports world get turned upside down this year with the new name image and likeness laws. And we're, we've heard a lot about what it's going to do for football and basketball. How do you think it's going to change the landscape of college softball? Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know. I mean, I'm sure your conversations have been fun. And the two of you probably have had a lot of conversations about it too, because um, we don't know where it's going to go. 
Um, I've had four players, um, you know, sign some deals. They're not in the millions, like some of these football players. And, um, but you know, an extra 2000, 5,000, $6,000 goes a long way. And if you were to ask any normal student at a university to be able to sign, you know, like I'm a really good piano player. I'm a really good chemistry major. Like I'm, you know, like sign, like they would be all over that. Right. So what a cool opportunity for them. But I look at on the other side, um, there's not many moments in life that um, money doesn't become the ultimate goal. And college athletics is one of them and amateur sports are so special. And, you know, I, I look at it and I'm like, how am I gonna manage this moving forward? Because social media is such a big part of some of these contracts and how many posts they get and how many likes they get, and where does those posts come from? And, and how do you manage the social media aspect and the, and the phones and locker rooms and the phones and conversations and the, and the inside information. And um, so I think it's going to be neat as we navigate it. I'm not against any growing of athletics, but I think money can just be the root of a lot of greed sometimes. And I know some of these college players aren't emotionally um, experienced. You know, I I'd say like me in college, like you're still experienced life. You guys are experiencing life and all your decisions have um, ramifications, whether it's good or bad. And so now you're talking about people making contracts for money. That's such a a bigger picture down the road from learning about yourself. So um, I hope to still be just a a support person. You know, I've always been a a coach, you know, at first, obviously, but you know, I mean, it's more about the people, you know, it's about your people growing. And so if you can be in support of them and, and their ventures, but I would hope that a player doesn't get pulled away because of a contract situation and something, and it pulls them away from the team. Um, Maybe from a couple players that don't have the ability to get those contracts. Um, I, you know, in football, how many of those guys every day are just out there grinding it out. So the super receiver or the quarterback can get, you know, get their time. And are those guys going to get taken care of? Like that's, you need those guys. You you need those guys. And, And we're talking about a lot of experiences um, in the pro ranks to, to feel how to take care of people and teammates. And now you're putting that in the college ranks. So it's going to be really interesting. And I imagine the two of you have had a lot of conversations about it. Cause I know I sure have too. And I know we're still trying to navigate it. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, take me back to, to when you first arrived at Florida state, you were given the tall task of filling the shoes of legendary coach, Joan Graft. And you see most new college coaches after kind of a legendary tenure, go through some growing pains, but How'd you go about not only carrying on FSU's winning tradition, but allowing your own coaching style to kind of flourish? Yeah, I think it's a, kind of a neat time to talk about this with uh, Bobby Bowden passing away yeah. and uh, everything that's going on here in Tallahassee right now and, and supporting, um, you know, his, his legacy. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's one of those things when, when people like Coach Graf, um, Coach Bowden, um, you know, Leonard Hamilton, um, you know, Mike Martin, I mean, he'd been coaching baseball here for, you know, umpteen years. Like the, the legacy was living with us daily and, you know, Bobby Bowden was with us daily and Bobby Bowden's a part of, you know, every time you hear the, the drum beat for the, the war chant, you know, the football team to run out, like, you know, the, they started that long time ago, you know, so, so you're living in it here. Coach Graf's name's on the scoreboard. Um, you know, she is a huge part of this program and she's a huge part of building this program. My job is to, to come in and, and make it just a little bit better. So um, thankful for the building blocks that she gave me here. Thankful for the building blocks that Coach Bowden did here for athletics. And then you just come in and, and you, just, you just try to make it just a little bit better. And that's, you know, the game's going to bypass me at some point. You know, some younger coach is going to come in here and make it better because the game grows and it continues to grow. It's a living, breathing thing and sport grows just like the NIL. And it, it's our job to just continue to give to it, give to it, give to it, and then hand it over to someone else. Coach Graf had lunch with me the first week I was here, and she was very supportive and said, you know, hey, call me if you ever need anything. You know, I won't be around a lot in the beginning as you get your feet underneath you. But I can tell you in the last five, six years, she's at every game. She's uh, got her seats that she comes to. She comes and talks to the team. Um, we have a great relationship. And Bobby Bowden was the same way for football. Um Mike Martin was the same way for baseball. Mike Martin and Bobby Bowden came over and talked to softball. Like it's a huge family. So when you're around legendary people like that, that have been coaching for 20 plus 30 plus years, 
you know, they're just handing it over to someone else to love it and care for it just like they did. And so um, I'm hoping in my time when I leave here, you can turn it over and, and they just keep growing it and, uh, you know, do their thing. You know, that's why they were hired here and they're good people. And, um, but you just want to love them. And, and Coach Graf has shown me that way. Yeah, and you mentioned just FSU's rich athletic history. What is it like to have made your own mark on that history? Yeah, um, well, I mean, again, you just put your head down and you just do what you do. I guess you don't realize that you make your mark on it because you're living it. You know, you're, I mean, you're in the – I mean, I know when people say the grind of it, like it's not a grind. I, I get to – get paid to do my passion. Like, it's so lucky, you know, there's people out there that nine to five and at four 40, they're like waiting for the clock to go so they can get home. And, um, I have luckily found my way into something that I absolutely love to do. So, um, I don't feel like there's a giving to it. Like that's my, that's my opportunity and that's my passion. So I'm just, just getting, getting after it, but being able to see other coaches, you know, here for a long time and, and being able to, you know, like I, when I was first here with Bobby Bowden, my, my first couple of weeks, um, we played Colorado and they played him over in Jacksonville, but he, there's a statue of Bobby Bowden out in front of Duke Campbell stadium. And there was all these Colorado fans out there and they're taking pictures. And, and of course, you know, you put on a road trip, you go to some, some venues and you want to take pictures and you'll see around it. And Bobby walked out and he sat and talked to those guys for like 30 minutes, you know, like it's incredible. Like, you're just not any bigger than any normal person, you know? So when you see that Mike Martin, you see him walking around, coming over, talking with the girls, hanging out with them, warming up, like he's not bigger than anyone else here. I think that's kind of the lessons that you learn from legacy coaches that you as a coach are like, okay, that's how you do it. Like that's how it's running here. That's what I want to be a part of. And then you continue to, to try to implement that in your fabric of your coaching too. Yeah. And with your head, like, you mentioned learning on the, like learning to become the coach you want to be. You started your career at UNLV. And I mean, the first job I can imagine being a head coach is always intimidating, but how are you kind of able to manage the ups and downs you experienced in LV, UNLV and what goes into establishing a program? Um, I think it actually started before that when I was at Stanford. Um, I was, I was the interim coach while they were hiring John Rittman. So I was there when they went from a club team so I was brought in to be kind of part of a, the transition from club to varsity. So we had no scholarships to two scholarships in the PAC, which had fully funded historically amazing programs, UCLA, Arizona, you know, even Arizona state later, like, you know, Cal, like it was crazy, like some really good programs. Right. So here we are two scholarships competing at them. So in the meantime, when they hired the head coach, you know, I was in charge of a lot of things. So I was lucky enough as an assistant to have a lot on my plate and be able to be responsible for many things from concession stands to handing out uniforms to figuring out how to pitch calling games. Right. So, um, so when I was going off my own to Vegas, um, I felt very prepared for it. The biggest change going from an assistant coach to head coach is everything's on your shoulders. You don't ever feel that. And yeah, I think when I speak to coaches, I always let them know, like, you know, I'm sitting talking to coaches in this room and probably majority of you guys are assistant coaches and you don't know what it's like to be a head coach and you head coaches, you know, got to understand your assistants don't know what it's like to be a head coach. So until you're that person that puts your head on a pillow at night and your head just warming with like, oh, are the kids okay? Am I, am I doing right? Am I communicating with coaches? Am I recruiting the right people? Like it all lands on your shoulders. That's a completely different feeling. So completely prepared for it, was ready for it. Then you got to experience it just all landing on your lap and you answering to it. And uh, I think that was the biggest change for me. Um, but again, um, as you go through it, if you give your all every single day, if you can brush your teeth at the end of the night and know that you put your heart and soul into it, whether the decision was right, wrong, or indifferent, but you went for it for the best interest of the program, that's all you can do. And, uh, you know, I felt like that was just a daily check-in for me to know that uh, I'm, just, I'm trying to do the best that I can do every single day, um, you know, and then those days just add up. <laughs> and if you're doing your best every single day, the days add up and all of a sudden you have a lot of good days and, you know, you're a pretty good successful culture. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And just to follow up on the culture, I know whenever we talk about coaches at any level, there's always the conversation of, of, 
getting the players to buy in to philosophy yeah. and creating kind of a comfortable culture. And I know uh, I do a lot of freelance stuff covering the giants. And I know Gabe Kapler, the manager says a lot, we need to get the veterans to, to buy in, to buy in, to buy into our philosophy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how key is it to, to establish an atmosphere where, where your players are excited to get to the field every day and excited to compete. And I guess most of all excited to play for, for each other, really. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's funny. We, we use a coaching staff really try to break down a lot of our words and our verbiage that we use. And, you know, it's funny you say that Stephen, because buy-in is one of them that we've taken out um, because I don't want people to buy in. Like I'm not an infomercial. I'm not selling anything. You know, I am who I am and we are the program that we are. So it comes back to recruiting and making sure that I do a really good job of when I go out, you know, if I'm going out to recruit Jasper, I got to make sure that I see him in a really good environment of competition, of practice, of how he interacts with his family, like all those things. Cause my expectation is when he comes in, he's going to be everything that this program's about. But if I go out, I don't, I don't see the, the extra efforts, you know, in practice or, um, you know, he, he's really not interested in hanging out with his family too much. Like, you know, then, then I'm asking a lot of him to come into our program because I expect the team to be around and hang out with each other and do those things. And I expect extra work to be done. So it's like, it's not going to be a good relationship for me as a coach. And it's sure not going to be a good relationship for him as a player, you know? So I think the recruiting piece is the biggest piece to tie into what you say buy-in um, because you've got to be, um, be able to flourish in the environment that you're going to. Um, but if you don't have the drive that that environment requires, it's going to be hard to flourish in that environment. So, um, so recruiting is a big piece of it. That's a huge piece of it. And um, I'm very verbal in the recruiting process with, you know, this is what we do and this is how we do it. Like we're big in the community. Um, you know, we are a team. It's going to take everybody on the field. Like we give our, you know, everything we, we talk about our gate, our mantras, all those things in recruiting. So the day you step on campus, you know, Jasper comes into campus and, and we set up the first day of practice. Like he understands what gate means and he understands what the core values. Like he doesn't get there and be like, wait, what are we doing? You know, like it's a very, um, I don't know, uh, transparent, um, you know, culture, a very transparent organization. And I think that's what creates buy-in so to speak is because you know what you're getting into and now I'm just trying to push you to be the best version of yourself in that environment yeah and I have a couple friends that play softball and I was asking them about you and the one word that kept coming up about your team style of play is grit and I mean I just want to know what it means to you to play with grit and how you go about instilling that value in your players yeah um I think they do it themselves um, you know, we, we do a lot of different, um, training models, you know, we work with military, um, ex-military, um, we have you know, psychologists, sports psychologists, um, our coaching staff in general, you know, we really get after the weight room. Um, we really push in the weight room and, um, and our conditioning piece. So we have a four or five areas that we really push the character of players, but essentially the character of the team. A mantra of ours was last, last year was we bend, we don't break, like keep bringing it on not going to break us. You're not going to break us. And, um, you know, just, just trying to be very, um, friendly with adversity and very friendly with failure. Like those are really, those are things that would break teams spirit. Those can break teams, um, culture and and chemistry. And and it's not going to break us, you know, keep bringing it on. So to to a point where it can kind of get funny, right? Like, a bus tired of this flat we're late to the park oh you're not going to break us adversity it's not going to happen you know so the whole team's kind of stopped talking that mantra so then you become gritty in that sense because you're okay with whatever situations brought it on yeah and now like to get into your own playing career a little bit I read that you played both softball and volleyball at St. Mary's How, what was it like being a two-sport athlete and also balancing being a student yeah you're you're talking a long time ago now <laughs> like we're talking like yeah, yeah. so um <laughs> Because, you know, you can't do that much anymore, right? Uh, Even when I first started coaching at Stanford, there were some two-sport athletes. And, I mean, you guys know how many football players could run some track and and play football. Or, you know, Jameis Winston, probably the last one here that played baseball and football at the same time. And um, it's really demanding. It's demanding on the kids' bodies nowadays. They're playing year-round anyway. So not something you can do. But for me personally, um, 
you know, I, we didn't have a fall season. Um, so it was the University of Oklahoma that I played baseball or I played softball and volleyball. And we didn't have a fall season. So I had to figure out a way to train to get stronger for the, the spring season. And so that was my way. And I was lucky enough to, to be somewhat talented to be able to make the, the volleyball team. And um, how cool is that to be able to travel with volleyball in the fall and then be able to travel with softball in the spring? It was pretty awesome. So, um, but I always tell kids at a young age, the lessons I learned playing so many sports and the lessons I learned um, in college, right? Like I wasn't a great volleyball player. I was a pretty good softball player, but you learn lessons about being part of a team from different cultures and different teams. And so, man, these kids that are specializing at the age of eight, nine, 10, like they're losing opportunities to learn what team from basketball or team of track or a team of tennis, like all those teams bring different things that can make you a better uh, leader within your sport, uh, you know, a, a better competitor within your sport. And when you start to specialize, you lose those other lessons. And uh, I think it's so important. And so, you know, it's something that I get to speak to a lot. A lot of players don't get to do that in college, but they could sure do it in high school. They could, they could definitely do those things, you know, earlier in life and continue to get those lessons. Yeah. And after college, you went and played softball in the Netherlands for a little bit. And I think you see a lot of these college or college softball players kind of become stars during the college world series, but yeah. there isn't like kind of a flagships professional league in the U S like the WNBA or the mm -hmm. uh, women's PGA tour. Um, where do they kind of go after they graduate? What do they do? Does the game just pass them by or. Yeah, I know it is kind of, um, it's sad, you know, I, I thought of that 2018 when Jesse Warren made that play, that diving catch and double play. And, you know, it, it made um, a lot of news, like sports centers and highlights and everyone's talking about it. And I still to this day get emails of people saying, I made the Jesse Warren catch, you know, so it's like a Pete Rose, you know, like, you know, I did a PD in the third, you know, like I did a Jesse, like that's so cool. So if she was in college baseball, she would have signed a million dollar contract and gone on and she's in softball and she signed, I think like a $6,000 contract and, you know, plays pro sports, you know, so we're in the very early stages, women's athletics in general is in the early stages. And at times it can be frustrating that they, you know, we can't go on and continue to play. Um, you even look at the Olympics right now. It was awesome. Um, Japan is amazing. U S players, amazing. Canada's up there now. Australia was good. But now we're not in France, you know, so we're out for the next four cycle and then we're hopefully back in for the 2028s, you know, so it's like you're losing a lot of momentum because we're in and out of things, in and out of things. And so, um, so, yeah, I went off and played in Holland, you know, I got a flat, you know, I, I didn't get paid, but my payment was a flat and I got some travel, incredible experience for me for life. Um, and I have some players right now, Caitlin Arnold's heading over to Italy. She's going to play in Italy this summer, an incredible experience. But to actually cash in, get a 401k, make some money and change your life, you know, those are few and far between right now. Um, but, you know, we're still kicking away and still pushing. Um, you look at the ratings of Women's College World Series. You look at how many people are at the Women's College World Series. The two of you interested to even talk about softball right now, like it's an incredible game. Um, the commitment that these women have to be the best they can be. And, you know, they're just, they're just knocking on the door of next level athleticism because they're leaving college at 21, 22, and they haven't even hit their prime of their abilities of what they can do. So I don't know how far around the corner um, we are to doing some pretty incredible stuff, but you know, I do know it is around the corner. Yeah, hopefully so. I, I mean, I think us in the baseball world, we've, we've heard all sorts of misconceptions about softball and, um, you know, what, what are, what are some of the differences, I guess, and more, more misconceptions that you've heard over the years? Cause I know I've heard, you know, the ones where, Oh, softball is for girls. And, you know, that's the yeah. common one you hear and, um, mm -hmm. saw a uh, baseball is harder than softball. When I've seen video of Jenny Finch striking out Albert Pujols and yeah. <laughs> he was trying, he was legitimately yeah. trying to hit the baseball or the softball, I should say, and he wasn't hitting yeah. it. And, you know, we expected, you know, I, I guess shorter, it's easier since the dimensions are a little bit um, scrunched in a little bit. So what are some of the misconceptions yeah. that you come across? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's probably one of them when, you know, guys walk out and they see, oh, it's a 190 fence or 200 fence, like, you know, the, the ball, I mean, come on, that's ridiculous, you know, but uh, again, you're hitting something coming at you at 
70 miles an hour with movement. So I don't care how far the fences are, you know, that the consistent actually hitting is, is the hardest part. Right. And then I think the other thing that a lot of, um, guys look at, you know, is the slapping game, the short game, you know, they, they look at that as kind of like a, a weaker version, you know, baseball, you don't slap too much. Although I see it change a little more. Each hero kind of brought that in, right. Each year was kind of a little, little lagging behind and we'll put the ball in play. And even t- Tony Gwen back in the day, you know, he'd punch a ball to left field if he needed to, like, you know, so like, it's just not in major league baseball. Now you're paid to hit home runs and it's all about the mochisimo and the home run side of it. But now how the shifts have changed, now team baseball is coming back into the picture a little bit because, you know, programs want to win. Well, team softball has always been there and it's not about the home run. The home run is nice. Oklahoma showed that. Um, but, you know, I mean, their, their girls are throwing our, most of our girls are 68, you know, 65 to 68. Um, the harder throwing ones are in the 70, 71. So if you say 70, 71, you know, you're pushing upper nineties, hundred miles an hour. And, you know, the one thing about softball is we can lift the ball. You know, I know a high fastball kind of runs a little bit, but we can actually let the ball run in and out. So you're covering all quadrants of the zone. Um, so, you know, at the elite level, you're seeing some, some pretty legit pitching, um, you know, and, and having to square it up. So I will take the positives that I've heard a ton. It's a fast paced game. Um, when you get people to sit there, you know, within two hours, the game's done, you know, and that's the one thing baseball is really trying to figure out is how to, how to stop the three and a half hour, you know, the pitcher coming off the rubber every time, checking the, the one at first, which I, you know, I love the true people yeah. love the game within the game, the, the true people, you know, sit there and they love to just watch the pitchers and the runners and, you know, like, are they picking signs? Is he going to run? Like, you know, but majority of people want to be entertained. So I think for softball, like we're lucky because you get strategic people loving the game, but you get the majority of fans just, just loving the two hours and I'm in and I'm out. And it's pretty fast paced. Um, so, and then the slap game, when people start to look at it, you know, if you get some kids that are two, eight, two, nine down the line, 60, you know, like you can't ball with the ball at all. They're safe. Um, you know, that element's not really there in baseball. Some guys, you know, but they're playing a hundred and some on games. Like they're not sprinting down the line every single time. Like they need to take care of their bodies. So, so there's just some, some difference in that part of it. But, um, but I think we're growing. I think we're different than baseball. You know, I think when you look at the NBA and the WNBA, they're kind of the same. Like we're different, you know, we, we have something different. And um, for a long time, men's fast pitch was an incredible game. And I was able to go watch a lot of men's fast pitch tournaments. Um, Travis Wilson played, he's from New Zealand. He played men's fast pitch. He's really good. He's our assistant coach. It was fun to watch those guys play. And they're, they're 85, 90 miles an hour. They are hurling it. Like it was incredible, but they don't have another level to play. So no one sees it. So you see more men's fast pitch guys coming into softball. A lot of baseball guys coming into softball because everything they love about their sport is here. And then now we that didn't get to play those games are starting to grow and get a little bit smarter. So I only expect our game to grow and get more strategic, um, you know, and get better and better. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of positives to it. Yeah. And speaking of pitching, um, by the way, the Giants have a guy named Tyler Rogers who throws submarine, and, he, and he's got a, a wicked rise ball. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, speaking of the pitching staff, I mean, it's it's handled way differently than a major league manager would manage their pitching staff. Also, in yeah. terms of like days of rest, and usually starting pitchers get five days, six days. So take us through the routine of of your starting pitchers and and how they're durability allows them to kind of keep going back out there for more. Cause I know uh, softball pitchers are known for their, their durability and their ability to bounce back uh, with their arms. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a couple things to that. Um, one, I think that you could have a pitcher throw every single day. Um, and when I was playing college, your pitchers could throw every single day. Um, but I know hitting wasn't at the level that it's at and we weren't on TV a ton. So there wasn't a lot of scouting. Now, in the last five years, you get every single game on TV. You get to break down every single pitcher. They have these crazy machines called Hack Attacks, which I know Major League Baseball has tons of them because I've been to the Orioles and Cubs and I've seen them everywhere. So you can have pitchers throwing curveballs and rise balls. You can face 70, 75 miles an hour. Like you can do, like hitting has changed in our game. Hitting has changed a ton. So what we used to do back in the day with softball. I think now it's changing towards a little bit more of a major league and maybe an opener, maybe a starter, maybe a reliever, mm. and then going into the closer. 
um, because the hitters are getting too good now. And the information that, that we are growing at as college coaches and players, you know, being able to sit pitches and be able to do some things is changing. So strategy is becoming a big part of it too. So, um, so fun, you know, it's funny that you say this. Um, I managed our Canadian staff that same way. We had a starter, Sarah Gronewagen. We had mid relievers and we had a closer in Daniel Lari. A couple games, I had to figure some things out, you know, over a six games, seven games that we were there. But majority of the time, you know, you're throwing 30 to 35 pitches and you're done for the day. Like that, that was pretty much it. So, um, so training for that's a little, a little bit different. But uh, on the other side of it, injury prevention, this is a natural motion. Um, but if you think about it, if you're coming around every time and you're landing, you're getting disc problems. So a lot of men, women's fast pitch pitchers have lower back problems because the torque of every time you land. So the reason why everyone says, you know, well, you, you can't get injured is a lot of it is because we don't have a professional sport that's going to put money into a pitcher. If we had a professional sport that's signing someone for millions of dollars, they're probably going to be on a pitch count. There's no way that they would let them throw, you know, 60 games a season. Like they'd be on a pitch count like major league baseball. So, um, so I think there's a little bit difference in that, but it is fun. Um, the one thing in softball, you can come out. So say Jasper starting the game and he throws his two innings. Um, even you go in and then all of a sudden I want Jasper's curveball to come back in. I can bring him back in in the seventh and he can close it out. Um, so that is something fun strategically wise. Like, I think that's awesome because you always have that in your hip pocket that your starter can come back into the game. And a lot of pitchers do hit too. So, you know, they can come back in, they can swing it or they can stay in in that DH role, swing it while someone else pitches and then comes back in and pitch and hit. So, um, so we have some fun, fun areas with that too, but um, we've been blessed with a good pitching staff. Um, you know, I've been lucky to have some really good, not only skilled pitchers, but great leaders in the circle. And uh, I look at this coming year and Kat Sandercock and Danielle Watson and Emma Wilson are three of them that got some really good stuff. And, uh, you know, if they can get their stuff with confidence, you know, they can dominate, you know, a good seven inning games with the three of them, if not a four or five game weekend. Yeah. And I actually did read an interview in preparation for this, where you said that you're not necessarily a numbers coach, which is really interesting. And, and cause I know in baseball in, in baseball, I mean, baseball people that are coming up now through the ranks in the front offices, like literally their ears are, you know, spilling, there's stuff spilling out of their ears, like numbers spilling out of their ears yeah. and stats. And there's a yeah. new stat every day and it's crazy to see. So do you guys use like any statistics, like while making a lineup or defensive alignments or, I mean, you mentioned some of the pitching stuff that you guys do does like second time through the batting order. Is that kind of stuff mm -hmm. creep into your mind during the game to prepare for? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I wouldn't say like, you know, you get some of those analytic guys and they could just spit out numbers and, you know, I mean, <laughs> even creating like the whip, you know, whip wasn't a thing for a long time. All of a sudden you got this, you know, you're watching a baseball game and now they got this box down here. It's got whip and this and that. You have to like, look it up. Like what does whip stand for? What are we doing? You know, it is a lot of numbers, but they're paid for that. Um, you know, and, and I've been able to meet with a lot of those analytics people and, and really dive into, cause I'm not that smart on that side of it but I can teach softball. And if I could connect the, the analytics, smart mathematical people and, and put that with my gut feeling and, stra and strategy, and you can combine that for sure. Second time through, if, if, you know, all I'm doing is throwing drop balls, I mean, you've got to bring something else in, you know, and, and, and start to see that. So that, you know, you know, that as a coach, but now you see that in numbers, then it, you can start to marry it. And I, I think that's in major league baseball. What's gotten to be so fun is, is the analytic guys that, that talk baseball and the baseball coaches that can talk analytics and they can marry it because if you get the two, it becomes really tough to do. Um, but yeah, I have my old school ways, you know, I'm a, I'm a doodler doing the games, you know, I, I have my own charts. I write, I do my own things. I, I do my own homework in that sense. And in end, it is probably a form of analytics. Um, but it's not to me, you know, it's squiggly lines and, um, it's, it's pitch counts and it's first pitch strikes. And it's just numbers that speak to me to know that I'm getting the DNA of my pitcher and I know what she can do over time. And when she starts to vary from that, that's when I need to make a change, you know? So I, I really study my pitchers, um, versus studying the other team's hitters. You know, I, I really like to know my team cause I'm with them every single day. 
And then, you know, when I see them veer, do something a little bit different, that's when I got to go to something different. So that's my analytics and that, that's my feel. But I also know Major League Baseball, they got thousands and thousands and thousands of at-bats. We don't get that many over college. So, you know, we, we kind of morph them together. Yeah. Yeah. So jumping back into recruiting for a second, I mean, at any college level, it's pretty cutthroat. And softball, especially, you guys begin to recruit players that are just entering high school. What's And you got into this earlier, but what's been your main philosophy when it comes to recruiting players to Florida State? Yeah. I mean, you got to love Florida State. Like, I, I'm not going to throw the red <laughs> carpet out for you. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to pretend we're something different than we are. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, you can, you can recruit off hype if you want to as a coach, but then you got to make sure you can produce hype for four years that they're here. Um, you know, and it's not hype all the time. It is grinding 6am workouts. It's failure. It's a lot of things. So, you know, we're going to be who we are and, and the ones that love us, you know, are the ones that are going to be pretty good here. Yeah. And I mean, without giving away too many of your circuits, what is your pitch to recruits? Uh, you know, it's funny. I don't think I really have a pitch. Um, I think, uh, you know, I would say my pitch in general is just our relationship building. Honestly, like there, there's at no point is there like, you know, here's the one for the giver speech. Like, let's go. It's, it's like, okay, you've seen our program, you know, what we're about, like, what do you think? Are you going to be able to fit here? And, and honestly, I, I really get into like, can you contribute here? Because it's, I'm not going to bring you in here and then we're going to change you. Like we're bringing you in here, contribute. And I'm not saying softball, you know, I'm saying being legendary and, and the person you are and contribute that way. So um, yeah, so there, there is no pitch crazy enough, which goes back to maybe Steven's buy-in, you know, I mean, we, we literally, we are who we are. Can't and, use that word. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> no, I know. I know. I don't mean to come off like you, but I think it's interesting when you guys, when you guys have conversations, you start to say things and then you look at that, like, what am I, what does that word really mean? Or what does this phrase really mean? Cause we take it for granted sometimes. And then when you really dive into the phrase or the word or the meaning, and then, you know, then it comes back to like, Oh, is this really part of our culture? Is this really what we do? So, um, so yeah, not, not taking that personal, but you know, definitely something that we've talked about. So yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So before we wrap up yeah. here next season, 2022, what are you looking forward to the most? Uh, I'm so excited about this fall, honestly. Like I, I can't even look into February right now because we have so much talent. Uh, we have so many kids that just love softball. Like I'm just excited to be on the ball field from 10 a.m. to 5 and just getting after each player and making them better. Like I love the fall. I love September, October, November. Um, to me, that's when you're putting the hay in the barn and you're getting ready for the season. And I just, I hate to, because once February hits, it goes by so fast. And if you can't enjoy the building moments and you can't enjoy the, the highs and the lows and, and the crazy moments that the fall brings, because it's a lot, you know, these, these kids, when you guys talked earlier about, you know, what do they do during the summer? Well, I think the fall is, is you know, they're 6, 7 a.m. every morning running or lifting, you know, and, and we're as a coaching staff, we're there with them too, because you like to see the kids that, that really get after it in the mile or really get after it in the hundreds or the kids that just can't get after it because they aren't physically tooled yet, but then during the fall, they start to get there. Like you just see so much character revealed in those moments and, you know, just the, the glove work, the, the teamwork, the cuts and relays, the, just all that stuff comes together in those two and a half months. And so I absolutely love the fall. So I'm excited about that. Then come January is when you sit down and you're like, okay, what do we think we can do? You know, well, let's look at the schedule. What can we do? And that becomes a separate fun moment because you put all this time in, in the fall. That's great. Well, Lori, I appreciate you joining us. This was a lot of fun. I know me and Jasper, uh, Jasper's reversed his commitment to Wisconsin and he's not going to go play yeah. Florida State softball. I am following yeah. in his path. I'm doing the same thing. I need to get him a shirt. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. We definitely, we definitely need to play uh, for, for coach, uh, for coach Lori over there at FSU. So I appreciate you joining us. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. I'll take care. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Uh, you guys could follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at RizzoCast. YouTube, subscribe, Spotify, Apple Podcast, wherever you find your podcasts. Thank you guys for listening and have a great day.